So Misha, uh, uh, Misha Vasily has a question. Yes, I, I think it's, it would be natural to start with the last speaker because the transparencies are around. Ah. If you, okay. uh, I hope. Yeah. So I have maybe a couple of very trivial questions. Um, so one is um, concerning this is a spectral conformal field theories. Uh, can you please comment on? So the point is that the spectrum you say the, uh, of operators is the same, but the theories are different, which probably means that OPE, uh, uh, they have different OPEs, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is whether these are continuous deformation of the same theory or there is just a discrete families or can you please comment on that? Yes, uh, you're, you're right. They, they have different OPs. So the, the CFTs we consider here, the Narayan CFTs, they're very simple. They are lattice-based. So you can think about OPs as simply the geometry of the lattice. That's, the OPs are trivial. They only tell you which vectors, the, which ve the sum of which vector, what is the, well, it only tells you the geometry of the lattice. That's, that's all your, the OP is telling you. Now the uh, isospectral theories we found, these are examples of isospectral Narayan lattices. So you have two geometrically distinct lattices and there is no rotation, if you wish, uh, symmetry transformation, which preserves uh, Lorentzian structure and the Lorentzian and Euclidean structure uh, together, which will map one lattice to another. But, but nevertheless, the lengths of all vectors uh, are the same. Now, the question is whether you can understand those two CFTs as being continuous deformations. Uh, the, 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 the code CFTs I discuss here, uh, this is a discrete family because the code, the, the family of codes is a discrete family. You have uh, discrete vector spaces with binary components. There is finite number of codes of given length and so on and so forth. There is no obvious way how you can deform that. And uh, so, so, so uh, the, the, the examples of isospectral theories we have, they're certainly discrete examples. And I suspect very strongly that if you start deforming those theories, they will stop being uh, isospectral. I did not check that, but this is my suspicion. But I have two lattices, which are exactly isospectral. As soon as I try to move those lattices a little bit, which is of course allowed, I don't think I will be able to do it in a way that I will preserve as a spectrality. But, okay, thank you, now I see, okay. But, but strictly speaking, once you ask this question, I started thinking about that. This is maybe something worth, worth checking because I cannot, right away, I cannot rule, rule it out. Just, just think that this is an unlikely possibility. Thank you. Okay, uh, Misha, do you have more questions? No, uh, well, well, I mean, there are some other questions to uh, to the Mars to then, um, I mean, uh, I would I would probably wait. If not, I will ask more. Okay, just uh, uh, ask uh, a well, question for Maxim. Misha, uh, you have a question for Maxim? I have questions to Anatoly still. Um, I just wanted to let some other people to ask. All right. Uh, more questions, uh, questions to other speakers. Uh, well, there was uh, Andre Smilga asked question, uh, well, just there was discussion with, between Andre and Joseph Bugwind. Well, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I, we can discuss it in more detail if uh, there is time, right? Oh, uh, we, will. we have a half an hour discussion session. So uh, it's time for you to ask questions. Well, okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Joseph, um, mm, well, uh, if you just can uh, consider this deformed theory, non-abelian with uh, very non-local, uh, uh, with extra non-local pieces, can you uh, just say something about uh, the solutions of classical operations of motion there? Uh, including, oh. including non-local piece. So, uh, of course, I don't know any any mathematical reasons to discuss uh, non-local equations of motion. I don't know some mathematical base for that. 
I don't okay. know what to say. Uh, okay. I interfere so, here. Um, uh, excuse me, Andre. I, I had a similar question, but let me give an example that probably answers your question. Mm -hmm. Consider just three equations for massless scalar, box yes. phi equals zero. Yes. And do uh, filter definition phi goes to phi plus m squared over box yes. times phi. Then you will immediately get from uh, massless fields, you will get massive fields, yes. which means that solutions are not related. Yes. I mean, that this means that this non local, in, in general, these non local filter definitions, they spoil the, the whole issue of amplitudes of everything. So one should be extremely careful. Yeah, yes, you're right. So, uh, uh, Joseph, if I understood correctly, your procedure is the following you apply this non local transformation, but uh, after that, you just sub uh, subtract, uh, disregard all known local pieces in the action uh, which you obtain. And that's how you obtain new gauge theory. Uh, am I right? Uh, partially, partially, you're right, partially. First, what I obtain it is the most general form of deformation. The function H, which, uh, which rules this deformation are completely, completely arbitrary. You cannot say anything about that. To understand the possible application, we have to involve some physical, some physical reasons. For the some the, for the model which I consider it, we were able to find the concrete form of function, concrete form of deformation, which allows to find uh, the local sector of a non-local theory. But I don't know what will be in the general case. But it's subject of study. We can because this results like an existence theorem. There is a most general form of deformation. It is ruled by two functions. Okay. 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 More questions? <coughs> well, let me ask uh, Joseph also yes. a related question. Um, so, uh, you gave us an example of young mills, right? Yes. Uh, and basically you say that give me any free theory, I will deform it, and then uh, it will result in the interacting theory. So my question is, suppose you have two uh, abelian spin one fields. Yes. We know that there is no simple Lie algebra with two elements. So what, how it will be, uh, what will happen in your approach in this case? So let me say, I don't know exactly because it's a special case. Each case should be uh, studied independently. I don't know. Okay, let me uh, elaborate then a little bit. If you, I think I, I know what will happen to some extent, but not all. Uh, your examples were about cubic interactions, basically. Yes. Cubic interactions in young mills, you can construct for any F no matter whether yes, you are right, yes. Jacobi or not. Yes. But beyond that, it will be crucial, Jacobi. Yes. And the same happens for higher spins and everything else. Yes. So my question is, what is the role of Jacobi in your language? Mm, Jacobi in my language is some kind of consistency of gauge algebra. I would expect that this is precisely the issue that your non-local couplings decouple from local ones. Otherwise they will not- Not obligatory, not obligatory, no. no. I don't know that. Okay. I don't see that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, more questions? Are there questions to Maxim? Well, uh, you ask me. Uh, uh, oh, I, ask, I ask all people in the okay. audience. If, okay. if you have a question to Maxim, please go ahead. So, if there are no questions left, it's time uh, for I lunch. I think questions. I have a question. Uh, okay. Still. Okay. Uh, actually, this is. Uh, the, Sergey can I ask? Sure, absolutely. I, 
this is actually the question that I was uh, yeah I was starting to ask, but then because of lack of time, I, I stopped. So I don't quite understand. Can you please, Maxim, comment on the situation where some of the fields are on shell and some others are off shell? What uh, I mean is that. Um, Maxim, are you there? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just uh, muted the microphone. I um, take, for instance, uh, Maxwell Lagrange mm -hmm. and consider it as depending on metric and Maxwell field, both, both of them, but do not add uh, Einstein Hilbert term. So this means that you don't actually get uh, non trivial equations on your metric. But no, it uh, will. The equation will be stress transfer is zero. Yes, but um, but you you don't you don't get Einstein. So yeah, I won't go, yes, that's that is true. But this does not mean that the equations are empty. Yeah. Okay, maybe I, I may, okay. Um, to, 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 okay, maybe to be more careful if, um, so let's, let's just write a Maxwell equation on a metric background or a young Mills equation on a, on, a, on a generic metric background. The consistency does not require metric to satisfy, uh, to, to satisfy Einstein equations, right? So you can regard it as a background, it's an official field. Uh, okay, so this is the, I think is more terminological rather than Okay, thank you. Maxim, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, in derivation uh, of super Maxwell, uh, it is important to present uh, odd first class constraints uh, or local uh, kappa symmetry in the particle, super particle model. Do you take into account? But and it's a different. Uh... It's a different uh, formally. You talk about bring, bring Schwartz, right? This target space symmetry. Yeah, but uh, but it's, it's, it's a different, it's a different super particle if you want. We used uh, super space. Uh, the theta coordinates. Or, well, you can think, but it's, it's a different, it's a different formalism. I don't know. But super space uh, different? Or the same? Well, I think it is different, but uh, I didn't. I, 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 it's not in my active memory. Anyway, it's, it's, it's different model. Uh, it's different model. Uh, yeah, there's there's no gap symmetry. Super space. Uh, this non standard super, uh, super translation, yes? But no, I, this I fermionic, fermionic degrees of freedom, I introduced realized spin degrees of freedom. It's it's not it's not super particle. So you, well, uh, there is a local uh, uh, is spin particle, yes, Sergey. Sergey, it's spinning particle, yes. Yeah, it's spinning particle. It's not it's not super particle. In a particle, uh, it's model how uh, uh, how penalty for Nietzsche Towns model. Okay. Well, more precisely, it's Gershund, no, more precisely, it's Gershund catch model because it was it, it appeared um, eight years before how and company. Super space or target space, yes. Uh, there is no, uh, there is no uh, uh, target space. Thanks. Okay, uh, more, more questions? Uh, if there is some time, I would ask also some more questions, if, but if there are no others, uh, I'm asking too many. <laughs> that's good. Uh, more questions. I'm wild to give a uh, lot to Misha. Uh, yeah. So Misha, please go ahead. I have another question to Anatoly. 
Uh, it's just a very naive question, from, uh, basically about the definitions and names. So the first question is why it is necessary to maximize the distance between the nodes. Uh, is that just practically important in uh, minimizing the noises or things like this or what? Yes, yes. Is that the, the issue? Yes, I, I, I was very quick, of course, because yeah. I wanted to you know, give an introduction for the whole topic uh, within 30 minutes. And I said that good codes are those which maximize the mutual distance between points. Uh, yeah. the, the linear code is a vector space, but doesn't, one doesn't have to consider uh, uh, li linear codes. One can simply say that the binary code is a bunch of vertices on a unit cube. And there is no operation plus between them. You cannot think of them as vectors. But still, there's a vertices on a unit cube. And what is a good code? A good code is the one which has as many vertices as you can with a minimal mutual distance between them being large. And, and why, this is, why this is a meaningful definition? Because codes encode information. Each, excuse me, each, each point on a cube is uh, the uh, message which you will send over what is called noisy channel. It's a message which, which is a rover from moon will send back to you. And while it will go through space, it will be corrupted by some noise which you cannot control. And geometrically, it means that your uh, highlighted vertex on a unit cube will geometrically move somewhere because zeros and ones will be corrupted occasionally and they will flip. What was zero would become one, what was one will become zero, but you will still receive a binary string in the end of the story. So it means that your highlighted vertex will move somewhere. And what would be the recover, recovery procedure? How would you try to recover back the original information? You will see you will uh, see the kind of point you observe on a unit cube, uh, which you, re you will receive a, a, a vector of zeros and ones, which is a point on a unit cube, and you will try to move it closer to the uh, you will try to move it to, to the closest highlighted vertex on the same unit cube because you know what the code is. You and Rover, you agreed which code you will use. So uh, Rover sends you the highlighted vertex. You know which vertices are highlighted. So you will try to get the point which you receive and move it back to the, to the closest highlighted ones. And in this procedure, it is clear that the farther those points apart, more robust your code is. Because to completely corrupt the message, uh, one of the highlighted points need to travel at least half the distance to, to, the near, to the nearest closest one. I don't know if my explanation was clear, but hopefully some intuition. Definitely it helps. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And just a uh, terminological question just in a row. I mean, why do you call this quantum code uh, just as a result of imposing the st stability conditions? Uh, they are called quantum codes because they literally, uh, this is literally a construction to encode quantum states in the Hilbert space of n quantum spins. So, okay. so, so the information in this case is not a classical sequence of zeros and ones how it would be in the Morse code or any other information uh -huh. can be. Can, this is literally the situation that you have n quantum qubits, n quantum spins. You have the Hilbert space of those and your quantum information is a state in this Hilbert space. And you try to encode that one against quantum noise, meaning that uh, you accidentally act by some uh, op operator on your uh, state in the Hilbert space. Okay, thank you. And by the way, just, I mean, I just forgot that this stabilizing group, is it necessarily, it may be non-abelian, is it okay? No, it's not, it's not okay because, well, ah, good question, because you're saying that you can have non-abelian generators, Yes. but, but by sure lemma, there could be a vector which they all stabilize. Yeah. <laughs> That's... A, that's no, these are just singlets. These are just invariants of this group. I understand. I understand. Uh, it's a very good question. I don't know of a construction which would explode this one. 
I, I, I did not, I did not see in the literature a, a construction of quantum codes with non-abelian stabilizer group. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you just pointed out, that's a possibility. I, I don't know why. May, maybe there is a good reason why people did not go this way. But mm -hmm. right now, I cannot tell you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. More questions? So if not, let's thank again all speakers of this morning's session for nice talks. And now uh, this lunch break or dinner break or whatever. Thank you. Bye-bye.